we've got different parts of the state. We've got Western Nebraska that's already had their killing freeze. We've got Central Nebraska that's had their cooler temperatures near the frost, depending on where you're at. And then we've got Eastern Nebraska where they're predicting frost later in the week. And so what we're going to be talking about is what we need to do to put the garden to bed. What are the steps we need to take to get the garden ready for the, the winter season? And so this is just gonna be a pretty informal presentation. If you have questions, feel free to enter them in the chat pod, just like you have all season long. And we will be sure to answer those questions as they become available. Um, we're gonna leave some time at the end because this is the last session. So that way you can ask those questions because because we want to make sure you get your questions answered. Um, so with that, um, we're going to get started. Uh, with the vegetable garden, we have this presentation kind of spread out between vegetable garden and landscape plants. So the first thing with the vegetable garden is if you're like me, you look through the garden catalogs in winter and you pick out the coolest and greatest and awesomest seeds that you could possibly find. And I sadly don't do a map like John Porter showed me. Um, I just throw my seeds in the garden. And so sometimes I need to rewind and I need to go out and actually map where stuff was located at. Because we need to make sure that we're following crop rotation. We need to make sure we're not putting that same plant family in that location for at least three years. And I know John has talked about what plant plants are related, but we've got our cucurbits that are all related, your cucumbers, your your squash, your pumpkins, things like that are all related. And then we've got the solanaceous crops. So we've got those tomatoes, those peppers, those eggplants, potatoes. Those are the common ones that we'll often see in small gardens. And we need to make sure those families are not in that location for three, three years. So I don't know about you, but I can barely remember what I had for lunch, let alone where my plants were planted in the garden three years ago. So mapping it out, writing it down is going to help to ensure that you don't put that family in that same spot. And that helps with the insects that Jody will talk about later. And it also helps out with the diseases too, because if they're not in the same spot, we're not gonna have as bad of a disease issue. So writing it down, mapping it out, that one's gonna be key. Also make specific notes about how the plants did, if there were any issues. Now, 2020 was a weird year um, for so many reasons, but in the garden, it was also weird because it didn't seem like plants got started very quickly and then they're slowly coming into it. So make, maybe make a note on that too, as to what the weather was like in 2020 or 2019 was super wet different things related to that and that will help out in the long run. I know um, a couple years ago I grew the Mad Hatter pepper that Terry had and they're super cool peppers and they did really well but they were just awkward to eat. So it's kind of hard if it's awkward for my two and three year old to eat that we're probably not going to use those again. So make those really specific um, write down any issues if you had diseases or if you had insect pests or if you just had problems with it producing or cracking or things like that. Those are all really common things that need to be written down so that way we don't forget in a year's time or two years time or even three years time. So <clears throat> the next thing is, um, you know, you might need to be thinking about your final harvest. Um, like I had mentioned, I'm kind of holding out hope. Um, it's not supposed to get down. It's supposed to get down to about 34 is the lowest um, that I've seen so far here in Lincoln. So I'm holding out hope that a handful of those tomatoes um, and peppers will still ripen. And remember, John had talked about in one of the previous um, versions, um, presentations that, you know, tomatoes, you can r harvest them, put them on your counter and ripen. Um, so if they do have any kind of, of color on them, you can sure do that. You can bring them in if they're green, you can wrap them in newspaper and put them in a cool um, dark spot like down in your um, basement or in a cool area, they would be able to um, begin continue ripening there. 
Um, but you know, fried green tomatoes are pretty good. There's um, some green tomato jam that you could try. So there's other things that you could potentially do with those fruits if they are not completely ripe. Um, you want to um, try to get rid of as much of those fruits as possible when you're putting them back into your compost pile. Um, they're just gonna take up much more room. Um, if any of them are um, mature, then you could potentially be having tomatoes and cucumbers and whatever else growing in your compost pile next year. Because um, remember when Kelly talked about composting last week, uh, most of us, and I'm completely guilty of this, do not get my compost pile up to the correct temperature to kill any of those seeds. So um, you just really want to make sure that you're getting as much excess out of your garden as possible. You grew it for a reason, so you might as well use it. And one of the questions we commonly get is, when is my winter squash ready? Or how do I know if it's time to pick the pumpkins? So winter squash, if you're not able to puncture the skin with your fingernail, it's ripe, go ahead and pick it. If it's still easily punctured with your fingernail, see if you can limp it along. Um, try to get a few more days, like Terry's gonna try to get a few more days out of those. But we need to make sure that they're ripe and ready so that way they're gonna store longer in the season. I know we had a few people with butternut squash they're going to have a longer shelf life if they're reaching that maturity that rind is really hard as opposed to if that's not hard at this point in time but try to pick as much as you can because unfortunately it sounds like we're going to get some frost and it's going to be done at that point in time if and when actually when we do get that frost, then it's go ahead and we need to start cleaning up that vegetable garden. Um, starting off, we need to discard any diseased vegetables and we're going to pull and discard any weeds. All those need to go into the trash. We don't wanna put those into that compost bin. Like we talked about with the composting, a lot of us don't get our compost piles up hot enough where it's gonna kill any of the pathogens or we're gonna kill those weed seeds. So for best results, uh, the best thing that we're going to need to do is to make sure we discard, get any disease plant material out of there, get any weeds out of there, um, make sure that we are not reusing Using that plant material if at all. Um, we can remove all that dead plant material um, and that goes for, yes, I hate to say it, but any of those fallen tomatoes, we need to pick those up. Um, any of those cucumbers, you know, that got yellow and a little too big, we need to pick those up as well because those seeds are going to be fairly mature. If you don't pick up those tomatoes early on, after they're dropped on the ground and they sit there for a while, they turn into a big pile of mush and you might as well just forget about it. Um, so make sure to pick up any of those spent fruits uh, as quickly as you can remove that dead plant material after that freeze. Or let's just be honest, some of us were done before the freeze. So we can go ahead and clean up that plant material before the freeze as well. One of the other things, especially if you're, if you're, if you have a lot of vine crops, um, make sure that you're kind of, um, when you're pulling all that stuff up, you could potentially have some weeds um, starting underneath there now that, you know, they've kind of started to thin out. So make sure that you're removing all of that material also. And right now we already have our downy brome up and growing and I've seen henbit in flower already this fall. So be on the lookout for some of those winter annual weeds. Um, get some good control on them now so they're not such a big issue come next spring. So the next thing you wanna do um, is after you've gotten rid of all your plants, there's usually materials that you've been using to either hold up your tomatoes, um, your cages, uh, or your, your peppers, uh, cucumbers, whatever you've had climbing up. One of the best ways to do that is to make sure that you're cleaning that too. Um, I know all of us have um, sanitizer around our houses right now because of COVID, so you actually can use that out in your garden. If you need to use a 10% bleach solution, that would work too. But getting rid of those or spraying all of those tools that you're using 
um, in your garden will actually make sure that you don't have any kind of disease um, um, inoculum on any of those. So they could store and live on that equipment over the winter. So really cleaning all that up, you can use wipes if it's a small thing. Um, but also you need to make sure that you're also cleaning your tools that you're using to do that too. So you can use, you know, sanitizer wipes or whatever. Um, I suggest putting some WD-40 or some oil or lubricant on that after you do that on your kind of pruners and stuff. Um, they really don't like bleach solutions sprayed on them. Um, but you really do need to make sure that you're cleaning all those so that you're not transferring any kind of diseases from one plant to another also. And earlier this week, I talked to a grower that likes to put down weed barrier in the vine crops to make sure that the plants don't come up, um, the weeds and all that stuff, and it gives the vine something nice to lay on. Well, what he does is he reuses that year after year. And we had to have that discussion that that weed barrier that you're putting down and you're reusing every year is something that can also harbor some of those diseases and it's gonna carry it over year after year because you're always gonna use your weed mat under your vine crops. Most of the vine crops are gonna be related. So you have that possibility to harbor over some of those diseases and reinfect next year. So that's something to keep in mind. We think about tomato cages, uh, but we often don't think about some of those other things that we're using in the garden as well. If you missed our publicate or our presentations on adding organic matter or um, doing compost or doing cover crops, make sure to visit that Grow Big Red webpage. We'll show you that link later on so you can rewatch those episodes to learn about how you can improve your soil structure and add nutrients back into the soil profile. Ideally, we like to have about 5% organic matter. If you're not sure where your soil is at, we recommend a soil test. There's several different soil labs within the state of Nebraska that will be able to tell you how much organic matter content you have in your soil and let you know if you're low or you need more organic matter in there. Um, and then they'll also let you know kind of what your macro and micronutrients are. So, you know, fall and spring, before we start to plan our great times to go ahead, get a soil test done. So that way you know where you're at um, and if you need to add additional nutrients. If you're not using cover crops, um, one thing also is to turn over your soil um, into big, huge chunks. Um, Mother Nature is the best thing um, to actually break down your soil and improve your soil structure. So if you do turn your soil over, turn it over in as big a chunk as you possibly can and then add the compost. That compost will then work down into the, all those crevices and stuff over the winter and will really help improve your soil over the winter time. So there's kind of a two-fold um, position that you can um, choose if you're looking at your landscapes and whether or not you want to keep your plants standing or cut them down. Um, some people want to clear everything out, start a new and spring, so they want to cut everything down. Um, there are lots of plants out there that are very ornamental um, throughout the whole winter so to give you something to look at. Um, you can harbor some diseases. Most of the time when you're talking landscape plants, that's really not as big of a deal as when you're talking in the vegetable garden. Um, but um, some of the plants also will um, harbor insects and a lot of good insects, maybe some bad insects also. And Jody's going to talk all about that. But really look at what you have. Um, some plants will do better in the winter than others. Um, so normally what I do is I know which ones are going to look better throughout the winter and I will keep those up. Um, and then about March when it starts to get nice again, that's about when I'll go out and kind of chop them all down because the, the weight of the snow and stuff pretty much has done most of those in. But ornamental grasses, um, some of the sedums, um, some of the asters, um, some of the coneflowers, those are all gorgeous when you know you have that nice fresh snow and you have these little heads of, of snow sitting on top of the 
the seed heads. Um, some of these are also food for critters throughout the winter. So if you're looking at maybe, you know, giving some food for your wildlife, those are op options also. So one of the things that we need to think about is some of those, you know, tender perennials, those are kind of marginal, or maybe we're trying to inch them out a little bit west or more western parts than what they want to be grown at. Um, we can go ahead and we can mulch those tender perennials, but what the winter mulch does is it helps to keep the temperature fluctuations from happening. It helps to keep those roller coaster temperatures from infecting, from affecting those plants and having them break dormancy too early. And so if we're applying that winter mulch to those plants, we need to make sure that the ground is frozen or that it's really cold out middle of November or so. And then we're gonna apply that winter mulch. And what that's going to do is make sure that that plant stays cold and it doesn't try to break dormancy too early. Um, as we know in Nebraska, we have a tendency to kind of have those 70 degree days in January only to plummet back down. And so by applying that winter mulch to that tender plant material, what it does is it maintains that cool temperatures and it doesn't break bud quite as early. Now, that being said, if you do apply that winter mulch, we need to be on the lookout when spring starts to come around because we could pull that mulch away only to have cold temperatures come and then we have to put the mulch back. So it really is one of those things where you have to uncover the plant material for a little bit and then maybe cover it back up or just be on the lookout to know what growth stage that that plant material is in at that time. So I'm just gonna address the rose question because I see it in the chat pod from Lori right now. Wants to know if you trim and cover roses or if you leave them. Well, it really depends on what roses that you have. If you've got the knockout roses, some of those hardy roses, they really don't require much trimming. We don't require much mulching. If you have those hybrid teas though, those hybrid tea roses, those floribunda roses, um, what you're going to want to do is if you're gonna provide that winter protection from them or for them, then you're gonna to wanna to trim them back so they can fit underneath that rose cone or once it's good and frozen, then you pile that soil up around um, the crown of the plant so it's that way. So it really depends on what kind of rose you have, how you're gonna treat it. Um, so I just talked about this a little bit, but now is actually the perfect time to um, go through all of your tools, make sure that they're all clean before you put them away. Um, so when you are ready to go um, get started um, in March, April, May, whenever our spring decides to happen here in Nebraska, um, they're, they're all ready to go. So removing all the soil, remember use some of that 10% um, bleach material to make sure that you have no pathogens harboring on that. Um, add some oil to the surfaces um, of all the metal surfaces. Use some um, wood oil to um, do some of those handles. And those are just really good ideas. Um, get your sharpening stone out to make sure that the edges of your, of your um, your shovels are, are sharp and um, do your pruners, your loppers and all those and make sure that those are all sharp and ready to go when you um, are ready to start gardening again next spring. And it's also a good opportunity to sand down and make those wooden handles really smooth. So that way you're not getting splinters because some of us have uh, older uh, tools that we like to recycle year after year, so. That's a good reminder to me to do that. So now it's Jody's turn. Oh, okay. So we, I, I get this question every year, but people want to know what happens to insects over winter? Do they die? And the question is like, they survive and that's how we get them back every year. And there's basically three strategies they have. So Insects can't generate their own heat. Their exotherm, they rely on external ways to get heat. So they really have to figure out what they're gonna do for uh, the winter. And they can figure out that it's going to get cold because of the shorter days and the cooler temperatures. So they've got like three choices. They either migrate 
and we know the monarch butterfly does that. We also know the painted lady butterfly does that. Dragonflies do that. And then we have some pests like some white flies um, get blown in. So they aren't really from around here, but they get blown in. Um, the sunflower moth, these are all things that migrate in. So sometimes they migrate out when it gets cold. Another strategy that some insects have is that they wait it out. So they um, will just find a way to avoid the cold. And so they, they can hide in a lot of the leaf litter and in the debris that is in the garden, whether it's your vegetable garden or your well, pollinator garden like, like I have. And then there are a lot of different like uh, biochemical and physiological changes that insects can go through to tolerate the cold. And so a lot of people have been seeing those woolly bears, either the banded woolly bear or the yellow woolly bear. So they're the fuzzy caterpillars that are just kind of wandering around. Those are very well known uh, larvae or caterpillars that are able to um, survive the winter as caterpillars and not many of them can do that but they are able to like lower their metabolic rate and produce alcohols that lower their freezing point of the cells in their body so it, they can do a, a bunch of amazing things but for those insects that can't they have to hide and so that's where what we do to get rid of the insects um, and minimize them for the following year, especially if they're pests in our garden. Next slide. And so um, I just wanted to put this slide in to show that, you know, there are a lot of insects, but then each insect has its own type of metamorphosis and each of these metam like stages that they go through can vary. And so that's why it's sometimes really hard to be the entomologist and try to identify what people are sending me or showing me because they come in different forms and not just their stages of life, but sometimes they're smashed or, um, you know, squished or they're missing body parts. But the two different types of metamorphosis uh, that, that I'm going to discuss here are complete metamorphosis. And we know this from, uh, you know, the butterfly. So uh, you think of the life stages, egg, larvae, pupa, adult. And these type of insects that go through complete metamorphosis, they can overwinter at any of these stages. And so it's always important to know that. So whenever anyone asks about an insect or a pest, you know, one of the things we want to know are how many generations per season and what life stage does it overwinter. And that's to help do IPM and be, be able to manage them. Um, and then incomplete metamorphosis, this is when the insect goes through egg, nymph, and adult phases. So those are three life stages. And they're immature, so the small nymphs, they look almost identical to the adult, except they don't have wings and they're not able to reproduce. Um, for those complete, those ones that go through complete metamorphosis, they have those four stages and that immature stage is going to be very different than the adult stage. Sometimes they have different mouth parts. They live in different, like they live different lifestyles, different habitats, feed on different foods. So it really depends. Some insects are only pests at a certain stage and in different stages, they're not. Next slide, please. So this is really good to know about what stage they overwinter in so we can um, combat that through IPM. So if a pest overwinters as an adult, and these pictures here show some common garden insects that you may have had uh, this past season, these overwinter as adult. And so what they do is they crawl somewhere close by and they hide and they seek this protective shelter. So we've got the squash bugs, you can see different um, cucumber beetles, asparagus beetles, and um, so a lot of the beetles will overwinter as adults. They're very mobile, they can fly, the flea beetle is small and can and, you know jump around. So we really want to clean up that debris. So all the, the stuff you've been pulling out, all the dead fruits and all the boards too, the boards and all the equipment and tools that are in the garden. Next slide, please. So for those that overwinter as larvae, so the larvae can be caterpillars or they can be grubs when it's, um, you know, the, the, the immature of, um, of a beetle, these will overwinter as 
pupae. So they're in like their cocoon phase. And so they don't need to eat. A lot of the, the, the ones in the garden will overwinter under the soil. But then we've also got some that will um, be in like cocoons in trees, um, some non-pest ones in the garden, um, tree branches, silken pods. If you think of bagworms, you know, they're overwintering as eggs in there, but, um, or in their kind of in their they're all, their whole life cycle is in that bag. So it's going through there, but they're very protected. So when there's that layer of soil, they have, they're insulated from the winter. And so they can survive. And um, what you can do there to help is if you're going to, you know, uh, till things up and you find some of these insects, you can just, um, you know, pick them out if they're in the pupa form. Next slide, please. So these grubs, um, you can pick them out and I put them in a tray or throw them in the middle of the road or on the street and the birds will eat them. Um, it's, there's not anything that's labeled for, you know, gardens when it comes to the grubs. And if they're big enough right now, um, I don't know, I was digging my garden, I could see some of these, they're still pretty close to the surface, but how they survive for grubs, so this is the larvae stage, overwintering is that they go deeper in the soil. So a lot of times, you know, we've been having a lot of problems with Japanese beetles in the last couple of years. People think it's going to be cold. It's going to be a cold winter. Good. These will all die. They have their strategies. So we need to really um, keep an eye on that. Next slide, please. So I put the invasive jumping worms here. Um, right now, if you are cleaning up your garden, you may see these because they are at a very, um, they're at a very mature stage. So I actually did a, I think I did like a 45 minute talk this, this afternoon about jumping worms, but they have been reported in Douglas, Sarpy, Lancaster, and Platte County. If you do, if you're in a different county other than these ones and you have seen these jumping worms, um, it's a good uh, thing to let the Nebraska Invasive Species Program know. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about them, I do have some fact sheets ab about those. But these worms are not native. Um, they are, actually we have no native earthworms if you want to know that, because after the glaciers, they're, they were all wiped out. So the worms that we think are regular earthworms, those are European earthworms. These are um, Asian jumping worms. They're called that because they're from Asia but they actually displace these other worms. And not only are they decomposers like regular European worms, but they are like decomposition on steroids. So what happens is they de decompose and break down the organic matter in, um, in leaf litter and mulch very quickly. And so it sometimes depletes that minerals. And if you look at the soil, it will look like spent coffee grounds if it's, um, if it's been infested by um, jumping worms. And we've had a lot of reports of those. But um, if you find them, we are told you were supposed to destroy them. So do not put these in your compost and uh, feed it to the birds or just um, really destroy them. If you wanna see what they look like, um, they're a lot darker in color, they're rubbery, um, but touch it or poke it or touch it with a stick and their behavior will give you a really good indication um, that that's a jumping worm. They, they act like snakes and they act like something that is out of this world, for real. Okay, um, next slide. I could talk about jumping worms all day. So another thing that happens when you clean up your garden is that you see all these things and these are four different egg sacs or um, for praying mantids, they're called uutheca, um, double O word. It's a very strange word, but you know, these get brought in or sent to me and these are like the next generation of arthropods. So, you know, spiders aren't insects, so there's their arthropods. And most times people don't mind these, these spiders. So we've got the uh, black and yellow garden spider and then we've got the banded spider and they leave these like golf ball type egg, egg cases and they leave it in the vegetation. So if you're cleaning up your garden um, and you like these spiders, you know, leave them out there or put them somewhere under a tree, somewhere safe. And then we've got the praying mantids. We've got the Carolina mantid, which is our native mantid. And then we've got, sorry, I'm, I'm pointing at the egg case. So th this is the mantid. And we've got the Chinese mantid, which is not from here, but um, typically I let them both live and they seem to be um, 
they really do kind of split the areas up but the Chinese mantid will lay these egg cases that look like big foamy frothy things and that helps the eggs survive over winter because they're very insulated in there and this is what the Carolina mantid looks like and they um the the egg case and they really do lay them on like equipment so it's important to look at that like if it's wheelbarrows or tools that are left there they're pots um, you know check those things out they could even be on buildings uh, whereas the Chinese mantid they typically will lay these on vegetation. So when you're pruning things, you know, if you see that and you want that, want to keep them next year, leave them outside or put them somewhere nice and cool. If you bring these things in through the winter, it's not going to be as cool because then all these little predators will emerge and you will have a hard time feeding them. And I think I love spiders, but I don't need, you know, 300 of them in my house in the winter. Next. So the last thing I'm going to talk about are wasps because we had a really big year for wasps and I'm still getting calls about yellow jackets. But if you know you have a wasp nest, a social wasp nest, then you want to avoid that area for a little bit longer. If you're getting frost soon, it's going to get cold. These are all going to die. They're all going to be abandoned. What happens is the fertilized females will find a place to overwinter and start their colonies next year. So when they leave and abandon that nest, knock it down, scrape it off um, so you don't get secondary pests um, like carpet beetles or anything like that. But I want you to keep in mind those areas that had wasp nests this year, that means that's prime location and the next wasp next year will want to make a nest there because that's the good place to be. So scout those places early next spring and knock those down when it's just like this, just when it's got one wasp there because she will not be able to protect that you can just knock it down but you know right now if you've got a nest nearby there's going to be it, it's going to be at its highest population and you do not want to be stung um, so i just want you to pay attention to that because i care about you next <laughs> So um, since this is our last um, presentation, we wanted you to know kind of how to get a hold of us. So this is a map of the state and I'm sure it's a little small for you to see, but you can find this also online. Um, but you can just go to this epd.unl.edu and just you can type in your county and find your local horticulture um, expert. Um, that's closest to you or you can um, if you know any of our names you can type in our name and you can get our contacts so if you have any questions um, after this week um, we are all here more than willing and happy to help you answer any of your horticulture or gardening questions um, as we move into the late fall and winter and then next spring So I'm going to do a plug um, for the Master Gardener program. Um, I know a lot of you are already Master, Gar Master Gardeners on this already, but if you have enjoyed this and you want to know more, um, a great way to do this is through the Master Gardener program. Um, it, we do um, a lot of things. Um, you get about 40 hours worth of training and then you um, donate your time back to community projects. Um, you can go to mastergardener.unl.edu to find out more information, but just um, a couple things for 2019 that we did. There were more than 30,000 hours donated back to the um, back to communities across the state. Um, we touched or had contact with over 400,000 Nebraskans in 2019. And then um, Master Gardeners grew and donated over 18,000 pounds of produce um, through the program. So just cut some kind of little tidbits that what this program does. So if you want to know more, you can either contact me um, and my email will be at the end or you can go to mastergardener.unl.edu. We already got some people that uh, have always wanted to become Master Gardeners, Terry, so. <laughs> There we well, go. Check it out. 
And lastly, if you have some questions and you want to get your answers, um, we do have an option within Nebraska Extension. It's called the Digital Diagnostic Network. So what you would do is you would type in digitaldiagnostics.unl.edu. And what happens is, is you can enter in your name and some photos of an issue or a question that you have and it sends your question to a bank of experts. So instead of you sending your questions directly to me, and if I'm out of the office and you have to wait for me to come in, what this digital diagnostic network does is allows you to get your questions answered by whomever is available at that time to answer questions. So they're split up in several different categories, whether it be fruits and vegetables. We get a lot of weed identification questions on there. We get a lot of what plant is this or how do I control it. Um, so it could be whatever question that you have. Just know that this is another opportunity for you to reach out to Nebraska Extension and to get your questions answered in a timely fashion.